From a positive home pregnancy test to the delivery of a newborn, prenatal care is a very important part of the pregnancy. I'm Aparna Shridhar. I'm a practicing obstetrician at the UCLA Health, and I'm happy to talk about prenatal care 101. Today, we're going to understand the basics of prenatal care. We're going to identify some routine tests and procedures offered in prenatal visits and list some key components of prenatal education. This is a general overview of uncomplicated pregnancy care, and there may be variations based on practice patterns and your personal risk factors. Through the comprehensive prenatal care, we want to navigate through the pregnancy. We want to do continuous risk assessment, assess your psychological and social support and intervene as needed, provide you with some good prenatal education, help you to make the most well-informed decision for pregnancy, and also understand and navigate culturally appropriate care. What we do at UCLA, we schedule your regular prenatal visits from early pregnancy on. We do postpartum care and support. We have access to scheduled, unscheduled, and emergency visits. We have online access to all your lab records, ultrasounds, as well as prenatal records. We have a great network of specialists, whether it's maternal fetal medicine experts or high-risk pregnancy or other specialties. And we have medical interpretation services for non-English speaking patients. The first part is the home pregnancy test that you do at home. Once it's positive, the question is what to do next? Most of my patients ask me, is home urine pregnancy test enough or should we do a blood pregnancy test to confirm? Lots of questions start right from there. Urine pregnancy test is good enough of a first test. It's fast, easy, convenient, easily detects pregnancy by your missed period, and most of the times enough to diagnose a pregnancy. Very rarely, if we need to detect pregnancy before your missed period, or if you have risk factors such as history of pregnancy outside the uterus, you may need a blood pregnancy test, which can detect really low levels of the pregnancy hormone called HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. Now that your home pregnancy test is positive, when to schedule the first visit, what to expect in the first visit? Optimal timing for the first pregnancy visit is usually between six to eight weeks, but we may ask you to come in earlier if you have any symptoms such as bleeding pain or if you have a history of pregnancy outside the uterus, also called as an ectopic pregnancy. But remember before going to your provider, record your last menstrual period. If you know your date of conception, keep a record of that. Just your pregnancy test when it was positive, and if you can keep all your important medical records, and refresh your own knowledge about your medical history, keep them all with you. Why? Because the first pregnancy visit is all about detailed risk assessment of your personal and family history. We will ask you your current and previous medical problems, any history of anxiety, depression, or any mental health problems, We'll ask you about your previous surgeries. They could be gynecological or other surgeries. We'll ask you details of your menstrual cycles, any history of sexually transmitted infections, other gynecological problems, and every detail of prior pregnancy, if any. Regardless of the outcome, we'll ask you all the questions about your prior pregnancies. We also will assess your lifestyle factors, such as any use of tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, caffeine, as you know. We strongly recommend not to use any tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana during pregnancy. We'll ask about any genetic and familial conditions, allergies to any medication, any environmental exposure, work-related exposure, and also it's a good time to discuss any sensitive social issues such as intimate partner violence, or history of drug use, etc. Also very important to go over all your prescription and over-the-counter medication usage because there could be what we call as teratogens, medications or agents that can induce formation of birth defects. So it's always a good idea to talk to your providers about the medications that you're using. 
In the first visit, we'll do a full physical examination. We'll document your baseline blood pressure, your baseline weight and body mass index, a full general physical examination and a pelvic examination if you have not had one recently and pap smear if you're due for one. Most practices will perform an ultrasound in the first visit, but some practices may refer you to specialists or radiologists for the same. The ultrasound is usually vaginal if you're very early pregnant and sometimes after eight or nine weeks, it might just be an abdominal ultrasound. And the ultrasound will come from how far pregnant you are, where the pregnancy is, total number of you know, embryos, is it a singleton, twins, or higher order multiples, presence of fetal cardiac activity or heart rate, and evaluation of the uterus and ovaries. If there are any fibroids, ovarian cysts, we'll look for those. Based on the ultrasound or based on your last menstrual period, we will actually set an estimated due date, also known as EDD. And once the EDD is set earlier in the pregnancy, we usually make no changes to it, although some exceptions do exist to that rule. It's always a great idea to discuss the scope of care in the first visit. Who is going to be there at the time of delivery? Is there any involvement of trainees and other healthcare providers? Role of each member of the healthcare team? How to contact the providers or their partners in case of emergency or unscheduled visits? What's the cost to the prenatal care and delivery? Especially if the provider is not aware, they usually may ask you to discuss this with your insurance and specific plans to understand that better. Now, week 12 to 20 is all about understanding the genetic screening as well as some specialized ultrasounds. To give you more information on that, I request Dr. Elena Plume, one of our maternal fetal medicine experts, to shed some light on it. Hi everybody, I'm excited to speak to you today about what maternal fetal medicine physicians do at UCLA. We're unique in that every single patient will see a high-risk obstetrician such as myself at least twice throughout their pregnancy. Our job is to make sure your baby is healthy, and we do that by certain blood tests and ultrasounds to make sure that everything is going well. So one of the main things we do is look for Down syndrome or other signs of aneuploidy, which is an abnormal number of chromosomes. So Down syndrome is, affects about 1 in 700 babies in the United States, and it does increase with maternal age. The other common conditions that we look for is trisomy 18, which is an extra chromosome 18, trisomy 13, which is an extra chromosome 13, and then the X and the Y. So there's two blood tests that we do. The first is called the California prenatal screen. This is a two component test. The first is done between 10 and 13 weeks and the second is done between 15 and 19 weeks. This looks for trisomy 21, trisomy 18, as well as the alpha fetal protein, which looks for spine defects in the baby. This picks up Down syndrome with about 95% accuracy. The newer test that you might have heard of is called the NIPT test. This looks for trisomy 21, 18, 13, and the X and the Y. It's a single blood test that's done between nine and 10 weeks, and it is a slightly better test. It picks up Down syndrome with about 99% accuracy. The issue is that it was developed for older moms, so if you are less than 35, there might be a copay associated with your insurance. But nonetheless, note that the California prenatal screening is being phased out, so by summer 2022, all patients in California will be getting this NIPT test. And then the maternal fetal medicine physician will do two ultrasounds. The first ultrasound is called the nuchal translucency, done between 11 and 14 weeks. We look for a little fluid pocket in the back of the baby's neck. Increased fluid could signify that there's either increased risk for birth defects or some genetic conditions. And we also look at some of the early anatomy that we can see. The other ultrasound is called the anatomy ultrasound, around 20 weeks. This looks head to toe at all the organs of the baby, makes sure everything is developed normally, as well as the sex of the baby. And this looks for any genetic or non-genetic conditions. Now importantly, everything I've talked to so far are screening tests. So this just identifies a high or low risk of a condition. To evaluate the actual DNA, we need a diagnostic test to look at the chromosomes. So why might we recommend a diagnostic test? Maybe the screening tests have already shown flagged for something high risk on the blood or the ultrasound. 
you might have a certain family condition that could be passed on to the baby that can only be detected on diagnostic testing. You might be high risk based on your age, or you just might choose to get one of these more detailed tests. So what are they? They are the CVS and the amniocentesis. So chorionic villus sampling, CVS, is a biopsy of the placenta. We place a skinny needle through the skin into the uterus and take a small piece of the placenta to send for DNA testing. This is done between 10 and 13 weeks, takes about a week to get the results, and it is safe. The miscarriage risks are only about 1 in 500. The second test is called the amniocentesis. This is a similar size needle and collects the amniotic fluid that the baby's floating in. That takes uh, about one to two weeks, can be done a little bit later in gestation, 15 to 20 weeks, and similar, very low miscarriage rates, about one in 500. Before the blood tests were invented that I mentioned earlier, many women were getting the amniocentesis. So we do have a lot of safety data on this from all of our previous experience. So all women should be offered counseling, or offered counseling for screening and diagnostic testing. And all these tests are optional. So if this, is, this information is not going to change what you do in the pregnancy, you might not want to get any testing at all. Or you might be the type of person that wants as much information as possible and get more detailed information. Importantly, there is no way to test for every single thing. And even if we do find something, we can't always predict the outcome with exact certainty. And lastly, I want to talk about maternal carrier screening. So we just finished talking about fetal testing. So that was examining the baby for any genetic conditions. This is looking for mom's blood to see if she is a silent carrier for a condition that could be passed on to the baby. So we offer this again to all women, ideally even before they're pregnant. If a mutation is found in the mom, we then next test her partner. And if both parents carry a mutation for the same condition, only then is the baby at risk, which will then be followed up by either a CVS or an amniocentesis. So who gets screened for what? So all women are offered screening for the two most common conditions, which is cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy. And then the rest depends on her risk factors. So this is why it's important to notify your physician if you have any family history of birth or developmental defects, if you are from a certain ethnic background, or if there's any chance of consanguinity between you and the partner. And lastly, if you are the type of person that wants as much information as possible, you might consider getting an expanded carrier panel, which checks for 300 some conditions that are quite rare, but possible to be passed on to the child. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Sridhar. Thank you, Dr. Plum. That was so informational. Now, let's also talk in the same flow about some of the lab tests that are usually routinely done during prenatal care. If you see an arrow next to the test, that means that these are probably done in your first prenatal visit or the first blood test. So we order a blood type. If you are RH negative, like A negative, B negative, AB or O negative, you will need further evaluation. Talk to your provider about what needs to be done. Most likely, it will involve testing of the father and some other interventions during the pregnancy. Complete blood count, also called a CBC, we check for anemia, number of red cells, platelets, which kind of help us to stop bleeding, as well as white blood cell counts to look for any infection. There may be minor changes because of the pregnancy, so always talk to your provider about what the results may actually mean. Urine analysis and culture, we use it to test for urinary tract infection. Immunity to rubella and chickenpox, because if you're not immune, we recommend you avoid contact with any individuals who may have that illness. We screen all pregnant women for hepatitis, hepatitis B and C in particular, some sexually transmitted infections such as HIV, syphilis, and chlamydia glucose screening test to detect gestational diabetes, usually done between week 24 and 28, but sometimes we may do it early if you have some risk factors. And GBS test, also known as group B streptococcus test, is a vaginal and rectal swab that's done around week 36 and 37. Not a sexually transmitted infection, but it's something that you can pass from pregnant women to the fetus so about one to two percent risk of infection, so we screen everyone around this time. During pregnancy, we assess the vaccinations and your immunization status. We offer immunization as needed. 
there's usually no evidence of risk from um, inactivated viruses and toxoids in pregnancy. And we always discuss the risk of disease exposure as well as the benefit of vaccination compared to the risk of vaccine exposure. The most common vaccinations in pregnancy, the influenza vaccine or the flu shot, recommended for all pregnant women during the flu season. And it also helps to protect the newborn until the newborn is ready for its, you know, his or her own vaccine. Injectable influenza is very safe in pregnancy and can be given in any trimester. The other vaccine we offer is the Tdap, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, also known as the whooping cough. It's mostly given for protection of the whooping cough to the baby. And we offer it in the third trimester, between 27 and 36 weeks in every pregnancy, even if you're immunized in the past. And any family member or any person who is going to be a close caregiver for the newborn, we also recommend the vaccine for them. Other vaccines as needed, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, pneumococcal, and now COVID vaccines, they're all safe and are recommended in pregnancy from our professional organizations. Prenatal education differs in first trimester and second and third trimester. The most common things we talk about in the first trimester, nausea and vomiting. Majority of women in the first trimester will suffer from this. And most severe form is called hyperemesis gravidarum, but very rare for that to happen. But most people will benefit from taking prenatal vitamins, adjusting meal times, small meals at frequent intervals, not to keep your tummy too full or too empty will really help. Changing the types of food, like trying to eat some nuts, fruits, and crackers, avoiding any trigger, anything that makes you nauseous, trying to avoid that. And if your symptoms are really severe, ask your provider for what medications can help um, to help with the nausea and vomiting. The other common question during prenatal care, how much weight gain is recommended? As you can see, we don't recommend excess weight gain because it can be associated with pregnancy complications such as high blood pressure, diabetes, macrosomia or big baby, or risk of cesarean birth. So ideally, what is recommended depends on your pre-pregnancy body mass index. If you are an underweight person, you have a little more leeway to gain about 28 to 40 pounds, whereas if you have the BMI of 30 or above, then you may want to gain around 11 to 20 pounds. But on an average, about 20 to 30 pounds is usually okay. And mostly weight gain is in the second and third trimester. As first trimester, because of nausea, you may not gain enough weight. Is exercise safe during pregnancy? Yes. For a healthy and normal pregnant, um, pregnancy, we do recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity. That could be about 30 minutes of walk five times a week. And walking, swimming, modified yoga, modified Pilates, these are usually great. Stationary biking is great. Try to avoid anything that has risk of fall or heart yoga or heart Pilates may not be a great idea during pregnancy. Nutrition information, always talk to your provider about what's a great way to kind of have good nutrition during pregnancy. In general, an extra 340 calories around the second trimester, up to 450 calories extra during the third trimester may be needed. One serving of regular prenatal vitamins is recommended. And aim for about eight to 12 cups of water every day. And amongst the five food groups, and I know everybody's dietary patterns are different, but depending on your dietary pattern, try to have a good combo of a carbohydrate, protein, and fat in your meal. We also recommend good dental hygiene in pregnancy because cavities and poor dentition has been associated with some preterm labor risk. So routine brushing, flossing, go to your dentist for your routine cleaning visits. If they do x-rays, make them do an abdominal and thyroid-like shield um, during the pregnancy. And talk to your providers because we have dental reference letters that we can give it to you that you can take to your dentist and have a good routine checkup.
Can we travel in pregnancy is another important question that people ask. Uncomplicated pregnancy, yes, you can travel during pregnancy. Best time is right around like, you know, early second to early third trimester. But talk to your provider because your individual factors may preclude some of the travel issues. And now with the pandemic, just talk to your providers about the risk of exposure when you travel. In the second and third trimester, I think we have, usually we talk about fetal movement assessment. Women ask us all the time, do we have to check the movements all the time? But not all women need to perform everyday fetal movement activity assessment. But if you perceive any decreased fetal movements, especially compared to your, how the previous movement was, you have to reach out to your provider. There are several protocols for what we call as fetal kick counts, but nothing has been standardized, like exactly how many kicks to be kind of thinking about. But in general, perception of about 10 movements in one to two hours is considered reassuring. And if you have any problems of like less than that, when you're kind of doing nothing but counting the fetal movements, just get evaluated as soon as possible. In every visit in the second and third trimester, we talk about preterm labor precautions. That's labor before 37 weeks. That's like contraction, bleeding, leaking. You need to go to the closest labor and delivery. Or preeclampsia precautions, which is the high blood pressure in pregnancy. And those with risk of any high blood pressure, you may benefit from some baby aspirin during every day um, and also some home blood pressure monitoring. But the symptoms will have to make you go to the labor and delivery. Can we work during pregnancy? An uncomplicated pregnancy, you can continue to work until the onset of labor, but if you have any complications or your pregnancy has any other issues, you talk to your provider and we can come up with a modified work or we may have to take you off work a little earlier and your provider will be happy to do that. We also have great classes and tours. Um, if you go to the website uclahealth.org slash birthplace, there are classes and tours information that you can schedule. And our classes are like, there are three themes. So we have childbirth prep classes, we have breastfeeding classes, and we also have baby care and parent transition classes, and they're amazing, and at your fingertip from home. Once you're done with the prenatal education classes, it may actually be beneficial to talk to your provider about your birth preferences. A birth plan is not mandatory, but it's good to have a list of preferences and discuss with your provider. From week 36 to delivery, we just see you every week, and it's all about anticipation of labor. We talk about labor symptoms, preeclampsia symptoms, what to do if you go into labor, and also good fetal movement monitoring and what to do if you have any problems with that. It's also a good idea to discuss when a labor needs to be induced. For example, if you have any high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, you may need to induce labor. Some women may want elective delivery. It may be good to talk about that with your provider. Usually we do not recommend that before 39 weeks unless there is any medical condition. And also, sometimes it's always good to talk about what are the common reasons for C-section. Some of them include baby not head down, called breach or other presentations. You know, during labor, if the heartbeat of the baby changes, or there is, you don't dilate, or the baby doesn't come down the birth canal, those could be some of the reasons, but it's always a good idea to talk about these things during your prenatal visit, just so that you're prepared. Another part of the prenatal care is also getting ready for postpartum care. What does that entail? If you're planning to breastfeed, it may not be a bad idea to talk about breast pump. Most insurances will cover a breast pump for you and we can get you ready for the postpartum care by ordering it during the prenatal care. Choosing a newborn care provider, we have a great list of pediatricians, so talk to your provider about choosing a newborn care provider prenatally so you're ready at the time of delivery. Also, awareness of common issues, like what's your pregnancy spacing looks like after, so talk about contraception after the delivery, so keep it ready. 
postpartum discomforts and what are the things that you need to be ready for, and also risk for postpartum depression, which is a very important and common problem that often gets unrecognized. So talk to your provider about that. We usually do check-in two to three weeks after delivery, either via a video visit or an in-person visit, and around four to six after the delivery for a routine postpartum checkup. So you could probably set those up right around the last weeks of your pregnancy so you're ready for that as well. So just an overview of the whole prenatal care. Usually a first visit is the detailed risk assessment, ultrasound, establishing your due date, some lab tests, discussion of the practice pattern. Week 10, genetic counseling as Dr. Plume recommended and some other laboratory tests to screen for chromosomal abnormalities. Week 12, nuchal translucency specialized ultrasound. Week 16, the second trimester screening for neural tube defect along with the prenatal visit. Week 20, an anatomy ultrasound to detail assessment of the baby's anatomy. Week 24, prenatal visit with glucose test to screen for gestational diabetes. Week 28, prenatal visit and possibly discussing the Tdap vaccine booster shot. And week 30 to 36, every two week visit, potentially discussing birth plan, birth preferences, prenatal education. Week 36 to delivery, weekly visits and kind of getting ready for the delivery along with some prenatal education. And remember, this schedule is subjected to change depending on how your pregnancy goes, but this is an overview. Thank you so much for giving us time to discuss prenatal care 101 and have a great rest of the day.